very much conditions based creeping vulnerabilities. Now, what do I mean by that? A vulnerability in and of itself does not create a threat. It is something that adds as an enabler. So when we talk about water and sanitation, if I went to the, to the Pentagon and said, look, we've got a real concern in Africa, we have the threat of water and sanitation, I'd be laughed out of the room. Look, we've got a real threat in Africa, it's poverty, would equally be laughed out of the room. Look, I have, we have a real threat in Africa, it's the impacts of climate change, natural disasters would be laughed out of the room. Why? Because those are creeping vulnerabilities. However, much like if you took those each as an individual card and began to stack those cards to create a house of cards, what would happen if you pulled one of those cards out? Well, the house would fall. Now, what we don't know is how fast the house would fall, which direction would fall, would it burn while it was falling, would it spill over and knock over the house next to it while it was falling? Yet these are the vulnerabilities, these are the security concerns that African militaries face. Now, why is this important? Let's talk security sector reform from an African perspective. When we discuss security sector reform here in the United States, we talk very much about, well, reforming the military, reforming the judiciary, reforming the police. Yeah, when I talk with African military leaders in Africa, they discuss reforming a military away from traditional kinetic-based defense and more towards the security concerns of that country. Many times I've talked with African leadership, many times I've talked with, uh, with African generals and, and uh, some others, and they've said, we consider ourselves predatory. Now, why is that? And at first I thought, okay, well, because a lot like what's going on in Eastern Congo, there's a lot of, of pillaging and plundering and, and attacks on civilians. No, what they meant was they were no value added to the society because of the way that they're structured. They understand that. One of the greatest and most coherent arguments that I heard was, uh, was from the uh, chief of defense in, in Angola. He was uh, asked, uh, a, a number of attaches were sitting around a table, and, and he was queried on, uh, General Furtado, you, we've, we've been told, or you told us that uh, you were going to reduce your forces from 180,000 men under arms down to 100,000, 100, 120,000, yet you failed to do that. Why have you not done that? And General Furtado, without batting an eye, looked and said, the only skills that these individuals have are pulling a trigger. How would that help the stability and security of this country, putting them out on the streets? The following question I ask is, General, how, how do you view, how, how, what do you want your military to look like? He said, I view the military as a vehicle for social development and social change. This is an opportunity that we have, but again, we can only achieve those things for which we have words. And right now with a kinetic-based paradigm, right now with the way that we traditionally view security, traditionally view the armed forces, it is very difficult for us to get our minds around the idea of militaries as vehicles of social development and social change. Yet when you look in a number of African countries, particularly those that are just coming out of a civil war, about the only functioning and viable organ of government is the military. Why can we not look at this through an African lens and understand that there's a real opportunity to use the military as that backbone for the vocational skills, the backbone for the training to provide for the civil service and the, and the skills required to build a viable country? When you look around Angola, you see a lot of Chinese building things, you see a lot of Brazilians building things, you see a lot of Portuguese building things. You don't see very many in Angolans. Why is that? Because the social or the, the vocational skills are lacking. What are the threats, the vulnerabilities in Africa? It's things that could very easily integrate women into the military, which the, could then be trained on these kinds of skills. When you talk with African militaries, they want training on water and sanitation. They want training on infrastructure development. They want training on health. These are things that could very easily have women integrated into the military, again using that platform as a platform of social development, social change, and then allowing them to go out into the civilian workforce 
and to build a more stable and prosperous uh, country, which would then allow for more, uh, more uh, economic, economic viability. Yet a lot of these things can't happen because we are hobbled by a lot of our views of security here in, in, in this country. Now granted, a lot of the programs that we have, the ACOTA program is fantastic, very, very much needed. But a lot of the other things that could be done are seen as peripheral simply because that's not our kinetic view of security. Yet, if you look at the two greatest attacks on the United States, they happened at the beginning of the 21st century, and neither one of those came from a state-based threat. Hurricane Katrina and 9-11. So the question is, until we have the words, until we have the language, we will not be able to achieve the success that we need in this country. We will not have, this, uh, have the words that we need to be able to, to partner with and to understand the needs of, of our African partners and also those of the, of the developing world. So I understand we have a very limited time here. I will stop with that. I, I look forward to, to engaging each of you uh, in further discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for framing our discussion today and, and really helping us see it from a much broader perspective than only gender, but really setting it up for the discussion about gender. Colonel Diop, would you mind taking the podium? Thank you very much. We have 10 minutes, you say? <laughs> I will try to make sure that my presentation will end after 10 minutes. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Colonel Diop. I'm from Senegal. I'm the, in the Senegalese Air Force. I'm very happy to be here with this uh, wonderful panel. And I'm seeing very good friends who are in the audience. I say hi and hope we're going to have a, a wonderful uh, session of Q&A. Uh, uh, since we have only 10 minutes, I will skip most of uh, things I thought could be very interesting and relevant to discuss. And we will, we will still have time to discuss those issues during the Q&A session. I would like first <laughs> to share with you the context in which the gender mainstreaming uh, is happening in the military. Uh, this context is, uh, first of all, uh, about the fact that our president is someone who is known as interested in gender issues. So the political in, uh, uh, involvement, the political will. And we also have a country where at least 50% some people are saying 52% of the population is composed of women. We also are witnessing the wake up of women. Women in my country are trying to be involved in the issues that are uh, their issues. They're waking up. We can, we, can, we can see, we can feel that. Uh, we also have witnessed many bad practices in our neighboring countries. We are aware of the fact that in many military in our surrounding countries, the women are not very well treated. And this is also a concern for us. And finally, I happened to be working in an institute where we have been these last months trying to explain to people that the security concept has been evolving recently. From the physical security, we're moving to the human security. And I think Bibi talked about that earlier. I happen to be in an institute where we also work on professionalization of the military. I am in an institute where we're working on conceptualizing the security sector and the military in particular. And finally, I am working in an institute where we are closely working on civil-military relations, how we can improve the civil-military relations. And the work we are doing on gender issues <coughs> has to do with the governance, because we think that if we make sure that we improve the governance within the security sector in general and within the military, 
we will improve the civil military relations. And to improve the government, we think that the best, the first thing to do is to make sure that all the personnel, women and men, are treated the right way. So this is the context in which we are working on gender mainstreaming in the security sector and in the military. So to make sure that the gender mainstreaming in the military is going right, we have followed the following process. First of all, we have taken time to review all the existing legal documents that organize the Senegalese military. And we have found that most of the articles were not relevant anymore and do not allow a good presence of women in the military. So we gave in a 57 pages document recommendations to fix those weaknesses. And we have also in a platform <coughs> gathered people from the civil society people who have worked as former ministers, people who were former chief of defense staff. In the diverse platform, we have, for about one month and a half, <coughs> discussed all the issues we found that needed to be fixed. We also undertook interviews uh, with the first pioneers woman. We have undertaken interviews with people who were the first one to receive the first woman in the military. And we did not want to be pretentious to be the f only ones to give our opinion on what needed to be done. So we decided to organize a conference during which we shared our opinions with a larger audience composed of people coming from all the components of the security sector. And we validated our recommendation. And from there, we went to the Ministry of Gender and showed them our work and confronted our work with the national strategy on equity and equality on gender issues at the national level to make sure that what the military are doing in Senegal is in line with what is being done at the national level. We have also worked with them to make sure that we were in line with all the conventions our country signed and ratified at the regional level, at the international level also. And finally, we worked with the Ministry of Gender to make sure that we had a realistic roadmap that will allow us to empower the Senegalese military in a way people all the categories will be able to deal with gender issues. <coughs> and we also worked on a policy or sectorial policy on gender to do the theory that is needed to make sure that the practice will go well. So these are the things we have done in Senegal in this particular context I described earlier. And I think that we were very successful. Our hierarchy is very happy about what we have done. And to me, I think that the reasons why we were successful have to do first with the political will, the strong political will, which was there. Our president was the one who said, we need to have our military mirror our society. Our Minister of Defense told us we need to make sure that this process will be done in the right way. So the political will is there. We were also very inclusive. We had a platform, as I told you, composed of diverse uh, people coming from diverse backgrounds. And these people, one of these people uh, uh, was the one who wrote most of the legal documents. So we were able to understand the spirit of most of <coughs> these documents and work on that. We undertook, as I told you, interviews 
with people coming from all the components of the security sector and shared their experiences. We have partnered with specialized organizations because we told ourselves that instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, we just need to go and partner with organizations that have done very good work on gender issues and try to see what we can learn from them and just make sure that we adapt what they have done to our context. We also were, uh, we made sure that women were part of this process because we have the tendency as men to decide on behalf of women and this is wrong. So this time we made sure that women were part of this process. We were also able to contextualize. We have learned a lot from other organizations, from other countries. When we were organizing this conference, we invited a general woman from the US who shared her experience as a female officer in the American military. We invited a general from Gabon who shared her experience. We invited officers from Mali, from Nigeria, from the Gambia who shared their experiences, but we made sure that what we heard from them was contextualized, because Senegal is different. We have our own culture. We have our own history. We have our own mindset. We have our own people. And contextualizing is something which is very important. We cannot take recipes from somewhere else and apply them uh, without contextualizing them. So I think that the fact that we have taken time to contextualize was also very important. And finally, we conceptualized, because I'm a strong believer that what is not well conceptualized cannot be well practiced. You need to take time to do the theory, to make sure that you know where you're going, to set your objectives, to think of the capacities you need to see what ways you will be using to take your capacities to reach your goals if you want to be successful. If you don't do that, you will not be. So we also have taken time to conceptualize the process we were going through. These are the things I wanted to share with you. And I will be more than happy to go into the details during the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Diop, for very uh, clearly laying out what you all have done, and uh, I think it will stimulate a lot of uh, discussion. Good morning. Wally. <laughs> Thank you. Can you bring this into our, our view I'll, here I'll in the United States? Thank well, you. good morning. Thanks uh, for having me here. I'm honored and humbled to be part of the panel. Um, I'm, I'm clearly, uh, they're very credible. He's published. He's a uh, Voice of authority on the on the on the subject, and and um, Major Ahern is a both a female and in the military, so beats me on both <laughs> counts. Yeah, so so I'm I'm probably the least credible guy. I feel like I'm trying to get out of jury duty here, but um, I, I so I don't speak with a lot of authority on this subject, but I think that's okay, um, and, and I'll explain that. About 18 years in the service in a decidedly non-gender integrated. Uh, field of, of professional work. Um, as a special forces officer, there are, there are no uh, female Green Berets out there. I served the first half of my career without ever serving in a unit with a female. Um, and uh, to be quite honest, social justice issues to include gender mainstreaming are not on the, on the, the top of the list of things that we teach um, special forces guys. It's just not one of those things that we focus on, maybe to our demise, and, and I'm certainly open to, to discuss that. But despite my lack of credentials, I think sometimes having that, that person with a, with a separate point of view or something from outside the group is good. And I'll explain, explain to you why, a, a, a case in point, my neighbor was stealing my chicken eggs. I, I keep chickens, and um, they're wonderful, great, great pets. <laughs> but uh, my neighbor was stealing my eggs, and this is a true story, honest to God. <laughs> and uh, we thought to ourselves, that's just not right. It's, you know, something, something must be done. So my wife and I were discussing, clearly we have to post a sign, 
on the coop with explain, you know, why it's wrong to steal her eggs. <laughs> and we, my wife and I sat at the dinner table and uh, a half an hour of proposing different, different uh, uh, things to put on the sign to determine what would be the best way to keep our neighbor Pam, Pam from stealing our eggs. And uh, we came up with various incantations and finally my son, 13 years old, clearly not an expert in, in anything but uh, video games, turned to us and said, Dad, why don't you just pick a sign that says, Pam, don't steal our eggs. <laughs> so just like that, a, a, someone who is not an expert in, in, again, anything but video games had the, the, the right answer. So uh, there's value, I think, in having someone who's clearly not an expert participate in the, in the discussion. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about what we do at the Special Warfare Center um, and why that's important to, to this group. Um, talk to you what I call operationalizing gender mainstreaming and then a little bit about our cultural support team program. The, um, at the Special Warfare Center, Fort Bragg, we, uh, we train Army Special Operations Forces. On any given day, uh, there's 3,000 students in, in my school. Um, this, as of this morning, I think there was six, we were in 66 countries around the world, Army Special Operations Forces, male, female, uh, mostly Green Berets, some civil affairs, and some military information support operations, the old psychological operations folks. So we're around the world. Uh, Pre-9-11, we were in over 100 countries. I think by the end of the decade, uh, we'll be back up to about 120 countries. So we're a relevant force. We are, we are where uh, these issues are important. And we're there every day, and uh, we're influencing those issues. My courses last anywhere from a few weeks to up to a year, so I have a lot of student contact hours. So I have a, an opportunity to influence uh, a student's view and then make that person operational and put them out in the force. So we, uh, I, I'm in a good position there. But I have a lot of things I have to teach these folks, so it's got to be important, so I have to show value. So I have to show the value of why, why is gender mainstreaming important. I think all of us here, we agree it's important for, for any number of issues, but to explain that uh, to a group that I have to train on so many other tasks, many of them hard skills, many of them things that, no kidding, will save their lives, shoot, move, communicate, and medicate, I, I have to show value in why gender mainstreaming training is important to them. So. To, to me, it comes down to operationalizing gender mainstream. What I'll tell you is that having read the, the UN mandate, and um, this will smack in, in the face of a lot of you, is I think we're doing it incorrectly. I think that if you create gender mainstreaming as a separate issue, and you tackle that issue, and you solve that issue, that's great, you solve that issue. And maybe by proxy of having developed some strategies to solve that issue, you may have solved one or two other issues. But for every issue, for right now, there's another group of folks somewhere in D.C. that are meeting, that are meeting about something else, human security or environmental security, resource security, human trafficking, whatever it may be. And they're just as passionate about it as you are about gender mainstreaming. They think that if you solve their issue, that the world will be a better place and, and everything else will fall into place. And it's, it's a house of cards, just like Shannon said. So what I will tell you is that I think that Isolating gender mainstreaming as a separate function is the wrong way to go. Um, and I think it's, it's extremely inefficient. And as a guy who has limited resources, I got X amount of time, I got X amount of dollars, and I got X amount of guys. And at the end of the day, I, got a, I, have, to, I have something to produce. I'm in a business where results matter. In, in the American military, we are here to fight and win the, the nation's wars. As a vehicle for social justice, maybe not so much. But I think, Shannon, that's, an, that's a, a very apt uh, uh, metaphor to make that I, I don't say quite as eloquently, but the, the military as a vehicle for social change is important because the social, social environment, the structure there is the road, and the, and, the vehicle, and the vehicle literally is the military. But if you build a car and it doesn't handle well on the road, you don't rebuild the road. You rebuild the car. So you have to rebuild the military, and it starts with the individual. And this is really where you gain that efficiency, is that if I can teach, if I can build a better person, and this is one of the soft truths, one of the special operations truths, that humans are more important than hardware. So if I can build a better person, I can build a better military who will then help me build a better system. 
and, and that's kind of touchy-feely, and it's, it's not a popular notion, and it's very hard to quantify. It's very hard to say if I, you, you give me a million dollars, and at the end of the day, I'll produce this product. But ha building a, a, an operator that I can put on the ground that is more aware of their biases, whether it's gender, or whether it's race, or whether it's uh, socioeconomic status, if I, can, if I can create an operator that recognizes their biases and then can operationalize that, it's, it's okay to have biases. It's okay to be biased, okay? When I stood up here this morning, a lot of you said, ah, that guy's in, he's a military guy, he's a knuckle dragger, he's probably not real bright, probably got nothing important to say, okay? So, so that's a bias, we all have that. Some people are biased towards blondes, some people are biased towards redheads. I, 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 have a, I came with a, a, two of my colleagues, one's blonde, one's a redhead, so that's why you <laughs> So it's okay to be biased, as long as you don't let that bias affect the way that your decision-making process. So it, it, to, to be able to recognize that bias, separate yourself from what that bias, how that affects your decisions, and then continue on with the mission, that's okay, because you're never gonna get rid of those biases, okay? You, you, you can't do it, you can't, you can spend all day long, you can't, you can't, you can't beat it out of a guy. It just won't happen. Um, so I, I think it starts with building a better person. Build that person because that's the threat that you're going to face in the future. That per you're going to, as soon as that person leaves your leaves your your care, and is going to go out in the world, whether it's a military guy or whether it's a, a, a an international developer, they're going to be faced with problems that you that you never f could foresee. So if you prepare them before they leave you by recognizing their own biases and send them off on their way, I think you're better off. So and and, and while that it may be unpopular to say that we're doing it wrong. I think we can do it much better, and, and I, I think I'm right. So I look forward to discussing it with everyone. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Well, um, Stephanie Erhern, you have the, uh, the difficult task of bringing all of this together here this morning before we start the Q&A. It's actually a distinct honor and to be on the panel with these and in the audience. I just I appreciate the opportunity. Um, so three things I think I want to focus on, and the one kind of goes with, um, with Colonel Walton is that I am in the Army, um, and of course these are my personal views is with all of us. Um, I consider myself mainstream. Um, so I mean the topic is, is fascinating and it's needed, um, but I think that in some ways um, I graduated 15 years ago and 15 years before that, women were at West Point. And so I think this has been, its to me, it's a good thing for the US. Um, it's a good thing for the world. Um, but I think that this is a time that we can have this conversation and actually help make a difference. Um, and so I think at a, a base, that's something that we've all, the, uh, the panelists have all trying to say, this is something that we can and should be dealing with. Um, but the second point is, is that I think uh, it's critical not to project the U.S. values and biases on others. And so it came across with the panelists, all three of them. Um, when I was in Iraq, um, one of the things that the Iraqis, um, the folks that we were dealing with on the Iraqi general staff was, they're like, it is great that you're in the Army, and we're just glad our women aren't. Um, and and <laughs> it's like, fair enough. Um, but I think one of the challenges are is that it's making sure that we're also not projecting our own biases on what other states should be doing. And so one of the challenges within the D.C., within the U.S., is should our military be used in nation building? A valid argument. Um, but the question is, is that if you're going to countries, like uh, Colonel Beebe said, that are saying we want to do this, um, how do you balance that? Um, and it's uh, going back with the context matters. And so with Colonel Diop is that you have to understand the situation. You have to understand the people. And um, with Colonel Walton, you have to understand your own biases in order to be able to move forward. And so part of this is just learning. Part of it is understanding. Um, but part of it is not projecting what we want others to do, um, but having that dialogue so that we can help them help themselves. Um, the other thing, though, with that is that whenever you're changing society, whenever you're changing the institutions, there are winners and losers. And so sometimes the people without voices um, aren't going to have the opportunities to have the changing dynamics. And so I think Colonel Diop has, has dealt with a lot of these issues where the folks with voice are able to make the changes that should be. Um, again, understanding that context matters. And sometimes societies and cultures aren't yet ready for those changes or, or don't want to ever. 
Um, and so I think the last thing that just to bring up um, is that a lot of what the uh, the gentleman brought up is there there are real practical challenges ahead. And you know, with Kathleen, with this panel, is that um, we are getting more in the mainstream, um, but there's a lot of work ahead and the question of whether do we isolate this topic, whether do we bring it into the context. Um, there is a real challenge in the fact that with the military, <coughs> excuse me, from the, the U.S. side, is that we are good trainers um, and there's a lot of us and you can send us on a moment's notice to go do a job and we will vigorously execute it. Um, not the people, the, the mission. Um, but, <laughs> but the idea is, is that we are able to do things pretty well and to learn. But is that how you want to use your people? Um, is that how foreign countries should want to use their people? And so that's, that's a, a legitimate discussion. And I think it's something that as we go forward, you need to have all sides discussing it. Um, the challenges that Colonel Diep has dealt with as far as his interagency within DC, it's a huge issue. Um, who has power, who has the, the right perspective, who gets funded, um, the regional issues, the international issues, a lot of topics, um, coordination, hard work, there's no, um, no, second, um, no shortage of need for that, um, but it's, it's difficult. Um, another challenge is that everyone needs development. I mean, poverty, education, around the world, everyone needs it. We're in a, a time where there's a finite number of resources how best do we want to pursue the U.S. foreign policy, other policies, um, in a time where there's just not enough to go around if there ever was. Um, and then I would say, though, is that in the end, and this came out f very clearly with all three, is that at the end we're trying to build better people, individuals, better societies, better institutions, and what's the best way forward. And so how do we deal with the, the gender issues? Um, how do we deal with the bigger government issues? And where do these intersect? Um, and how do we move forward? So I thank you for the opportunity to discuss. Thank you, Stephanie. We're going to open it up to Q&A. We have uh, uh, microphones on each side of the room, and if uh, somebody would like to begin. Uh, otherwise, I will take the opportunities in my position. I, I was um, quite struck by, um, Colonel Diop, uh, your comment about political will. It's certainly one of the issues that UNSCR 1325, which is the resolution that focuses on women, peace, and security in the world, uh, has been most criticized for, that there is the lack of political will in the UN to carry out this integration of women uh, at the peace table, for example. Could you talk a little bit more about political will uh, in the sense of how critical a role this has been in Senegal and how you see it in the UN context with 1325? And then I'm going to take another question while uh, Colonel Diop is thinking. Go ahead and please introduce yourself and any. Sure, my name is Chris Holshek. I'm a retired civil affairs officer like Mike Hess, uh, one of those old Army civil affairs colonels, except not quite as old <coughs> as Mike. Uh, Shannon, I really appreciated what you had to say uh, because, and, and, and as well as, uh, as, as Colonel Diop uh, and, and Colonel Walton, because contextualization is so important in this. And, uh, and, and David, your point about making sure that gender mainstreaming is, is under a larger rubric is, is extremely uh, uh, critical. Um, one of the things that I did, and I consider one of my peak experiences as a civil affairs officer, um, was as the chief of CIMIC, Civil Military Coordination, for the United Nations Mission in Liberia for 18 months. One of those rare Americans that actually wore a blue hat. Um, one of the things I did when I was there was incorporated in my idea of CIMIC, uh, which has also become very helpful to the UN policy on CIMIC, is, is incorporating gender mainstreaming as a subset of what CIMIC was doing uh, in, in with respect to security sector reform. And, one of the things that we did is, is recognizing that I was only the only trained CIMIC officer in, in all of Liberia, I, I started a course. And I, in, and I brought in members of the armed forces of Liberia and the, armed, and the police, the national police, um, to teach them CIMIC. Um, and par, as part of this gender mainstream, we had a few events. My question is, is re, with regard to an idea that I've been kind of mulling over for some time now, 
And that is, I think one of the greatest contributions AFRICOM, the United States, can be making with respect to building partnership capacity and contributing to security, security sector and defense sector reform is, is helping our partners build a CIMIC capacity. Um, because it, 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 uh, it touches upon all of these different things that, that have been, uh, and, and I just wanted to get your opinions on it because, and I think the U.S. is particularly well positioned for this, not just because we have the most robust civil affairs capability in the world, um, and I think that's no coincidence considering that we're also one of the most robust democracies in the world, and that reflects on civil society, um, but we are in many ways the largest, single largest and most successful multicultural institution in the world, the United States military. And that is incredible soft power. And it talks about thing that the, the threats and, and things that you're talking about. So I think that's a hard a very largely untapped resource. I'd just like to get your opinion on that. Thank you, Colonel Shah. Please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is uh, Jimmy Ante and I'm with Synexus. I'd just like to thank the panel. I found your discussion very interesting. Um, I question in two parts. The first one is for uh, Colonel Beebe. Mm -hmm. Uh, you talked about developing the language, and if you don't have the language, you can't address the problem. I was wondering if you've ever given any thought to how do you, the process that goes into developing that language and what it looks like. And uh, I think the panel as a whole mentioned, you know, uh, non-traditional security themes becoming security themes, themes that we mainly think of as being development, like health and welfare, uh, infrastructure development. And I was wondering, how do you address the concerns of development practitioners who have been doing that work for the past you know, 40 to 60 years and are now apprehensive because they're seeing it becoming securitized? And I was wondering how you have worked with them, if there's any uh, success stories or unsuccessful stories, and kind of what is the strategy for working in a field that was traditionally not defense appropriated and is now being seen as by the people who are experts in it as becoming more militarized? Thank you, Jimmy. We're going to open it up to the panelists, and I would ask them to keep their remarks uh, so. short so we can entertain some other questions or comments. Colonel Diop, would you like to start us out, and we'll move through the panel. It's, it's on. It's on. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much uh, for the good questions. Uh, first question has to do with the political will in Kathleen. Uh, I think the political will is key. It's key in the sense that it will at least allow the right advocacy to be done. So if there is a good and strong political will, politicians will take time to communicate with their people. Because if you don't communicate with your people, nothing can be done. So I think that the political will can help in this regard. The political will can also help make sure that you get the right resources. If, the, if, if politicians are convinced that this is the right thing to do, they will be willing to, uh, to, 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 to allocate the right resources. There is no way you can be successful in the gender mainstreaming if you don't have the right resources. It has a price. You have to pay for that. Now, the political will at uh, the UN level is more difficult to get because of the number of countries you have in the UN, because of the, the, the really contradicting interests most of them want to protect because of the differences in ideologies you have. So it's a lot more challenging for the UN to get the political will. But they know that they need to have the political will to do certain things. Uh, just to give you an example, to uh, vote for uh, the, the easiest resolution, it can, it can take forever because in the Security Council, you have these five permanent members who have the different agendas. So these are the challenges, I think, for, for the UN. And now, uh, for the gender mainstreaming, 
uh, helping for the simic capacities. I think you're absolutely right. Simic, uh, I will even say more, more than simic because uh, civil military collaboration is something that is done temporarily. It's not in a, on a per permanent basis. I would go for more than that. I would go for military just being involved in development activities on a, on a permanent base in quotation marks. I don't like to, to say permanent base. But when the civilians decide, the civilian leadership decides that the military can be involved in development activities. As I'm used to saying, in Africa, the public sector in most of the countries is not ready yet to undertake all the activities it is supposed to undertake. The private sector has no interest in being involved in many activities. So you have people who have the urgent needs, and in front of them, you have two sectors. One is not ready. The other one has no interest. While in the barracks, you have capacities that can help fulfill these needs. This is the debate. To me, it's the military or nobody. So we need to work concomitantly on making sure that when there is nobody, the military can fulfill these needs. But at the same time, make sure that the public sector and the private sector are in positions that allow them to be interested in those kind of activities. And for Jimmy, military and development, and uh, it's a continuation of what I was saying, uh, successful stories. I can say that in Senegal, we have a successful story. In Senegal, we have developed what we call the concept Armée Nation. The concept Armée Nation was built right after our independence because our leaders at that time understood that the challenges had to do with development, not to do with dealing with threats related to a potential invasion from our neighbors. We had to develop. We were coming from centuries of colonization, and we had to build new countries. And the military could not be out of this process. So we created the concept Armée Nation, which allows us, up to now, to keep the military operational, meaning ready to fight a war, if there is a war. Well, the, 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 the specificity of wars is that they're unpredictable. So we have to be ready for that all the time. But when we are not at war, while our populations are starving, are confronting these natural disasters, can we be useful to those populations? Yes, we can be useful. But we just need to make sure that we have created the right framework in which we do those activities. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Shannon, would you like to? Certainly, yeah. And, and I will follow on with uh, what Colonel Diop mentioned because, again, the, the importance of developing the language. And how do you develop the language? Well, I, I wrote a book on it. So, I mean, that's how you start. But, uh, again, the, the challenge that we have, I, 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 will, I will critique the book in saying this, that there has been a, a challenge to the book on the humanitarian. The, the developmental community has said this is an invasion of humanitarian space by the military, an attempt at a humanitarian uh, uh, space invasion. And then the military, uh, you know, in the, in the five-sided puzzle palace at the Pentagon, it's been, well, this is, this is banging swords into plowshares. And the answer to that is, yes, if you are looking at this through a 20th century defense lens, absolutely. But just like Colonel Diop has articulated, as so many other African leaders have articulated, those challenges are not the traditional security challenges. So until we stop telling Africans and other developing nations what is relevant for their security, so what is right for their security, and start listening to what they say is relevant for their security, we're not going to be able to understand that. And that, again, is, is a process of language. So that's the reason that we're discussing this in human security terms, because this is what we're hearing from the field. It is very much going to be the challenge internal here in, in Washington, D.C., and in, in getting everyone on the same sheet of music so we can, at least, we can at least disagree with the same language 
as opposed to speaking uh, uh, through one another. As far as success stories in, in, uh, in these kinds of things, um, you know, again, going back to Angola, a, a lot of the, the military, as, as Colonel Diop has pointed out, is the only viable functioning element in that area. So I visited a hospital, a military hospital, and there were probably 20% of the patients in that hospital were military. That would mean, by Arkansas math, that would be about 80% were civilian. And so when we queried the, the commander of that hospital why they were allowing civilians in the hospital, the answer was that's, this is the only facility within 100 miles around. So again, we have to take off that American lens of, oh my God, the military invading in, you know, developmental community space or you know, traditional space better done by someone else. The answer is, is yes, because they are the only ones potentially and possibly that, that can do that. Now, am I saying that it should continue to be a military mission? Absolutely not. Am I saying that we should not reach out within the United States military to the NGO, the development community, and, and integrate them in? Absolutely, positively lutely. Because whoever has the best subject matter expertise, the best corporate knowledge, the best advantage in preparing that society for those challenges, those are the ones that should be doing the training. Those are the ones that should be, should be reinforced and, and enabled. And so again, it's a matter of shifting that language away from defense and more towards uh, the idea of security and human security. Yeah, I would caution you about creating a separate language because if you create a separate language and you have to have translators for that. So keep an open dialogue, but again, extend that dialogue, that language across all the sectors. Don't just focus on on one thing. I think it's a little naive to say that, that development and security are uh, exclusive of each other. I think it's, I don't think they ever have been that way. As a security guy, I've never viewed security as a, as a sole function. It's always been in, in, in Congress with, with development and, and uh, so I, I think that for those, those that are out there that, that say, uh, you know, the military is getting into, into places they don't need to be um, I would say you can't do it without us, and we can't do our job without you. Um, lifelong um, international developers will tell you, I think, that uh, they have been most successful when they've been able to integrate more functions into their projects as opposed to less functions. So that isolationism right, is probably not appropriate. The, uh, I, in terms of political will, I, I would ask you, is, do you really want do you need the political will to be there? Do you need to have overwhelming political support for, for a process in order for it to function? And I would say you probably don't. So, you know, you can certainly operate an, a, an effective social marketing campaign well outside the political realm. And if you wait for political will and you give the politicians a vote, then you have to count that vote. So be careful what you ask for. And finally, soft power, I th sir, I think it, uh, Soft power versus hard power. And I think that's a, uh, of course, that always brings up a, a big, a big discussion. The the military, the, certainly the American military, n nobody can beat us at the military stuff. No, nobody is as good at fighting wars as we are. Uh, we've proven that time and time again. We have the best technology, the best training, the best logistics functions. We're we're really really good at what we do. Nobody can project forces the way we can. But that's a traditional war. That's a traditional 20th century threat, and we're not facing that like we used to. We still need to maintain that capacity, absolutely. But uh, so viewing the military as only hard power, as only a, a force of coercion, is, as I think, a, a dangerous step to make. I will tell you that the military doesn't recognize that. W within each component of the military, you you want to find your little niche, and if you if your niche is kicking indoors and blowing stuff up, you're only going to get brought out of the closet when someone needs a door kicked in and something blown up. So you have to show that sort of that, that ability to, to operate outside the traditional security role. So. And uh, Stephanie, and then we'll take our last question. Just one quick point on the, the CIMIC part. Um, I, I think one of the, the challenges with the military and, and the Army is that in addition to being a professional organization, we're also a large bureaucracy. So we have 1.1 million people-ish. Um, and one of the challenges of setting up more CIMICs is making sure that, the again, the countries actually care about wanting to promote this. When it was in Iraq, they had a civil affairs section that was set up in the Iraqi army staff, and they had no idea what to do with it. I'm like, 
what would we use this for? And so I think just making sure that we're, we're going back to the context and what does that country need? What, does, um, what do those institutions and those leaders need? Um, and if we can keep that component in, that I think you can actually be a useful change for the Army, for the military. Um, but a one size fits all often doesn't work. Thank you for that. And finally, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Greg Fernsmeyer, uh, Colonel U.S. Air Force, retired. My, uh, currently at Deloitte Consulting, but my previous life I was uh, responsible for uh, DOD security cooperation and building partner capacity programs and policies. Uh, I'll be the first to admit that gender mainstream was not uh, a priority uh, when we developed the guidance in the, for the employment of course and career campaign plans. So looking to you, especially in light of uh, the Secretary of State's commitment National Action Plan to, to uh, implement UN Security Council Resolution 1325. What should uh, gender mainstreaming look like in uh, DOD and State Department security cooperation programs? What uh, practical steps should be taken to both uh, mainstream women as participants, but also mainstream uh, women's issues in, in education and training programs? And also, uh, you know, Colonel Diop from a kind of a recipient of U.S. Uh, military to military engagement. Uh, you know, what what sort of programs would be of benefit to Senegal uh, and to other states in your region? Thank you for, so much for that question, and uh, we'll end on these last comments. So, if you have any final remarks that you'd like to make, and um, I'll start again uh, with Colonel Diop, and uh, we'll move through the panel again. <coughs> Thank you very much for uh, your, your question. Uh, I think what uh, we're already witnessing a lot of benefits uh, uh, from the collaboration and cooperation we have with the US, at least in this domain. Uh, when we were done uh, working on the roadmap, we will be uh, following to make sure that we empower our military on gender issues. Uh, we have uh, worked with the US Embassy in Dakar. And uh, the Office for Security Cooperation will be helping us run certain of the events. And the fact is that also we had a senior officer, female senior officer, uh, coming to Senegal and sharing her experience with the Senegalese military was extremely uh, helpful to, to us in the process we are in now. And uh, for the 13, uh, tw 25, uh, I think that all this support we're receiving from the US can help us uh, succeed on the gender mainstreaming process and make sure that our military will be uh, better regarded by our society and will have their trust. So this will positively impact, for sure, the violences that uh, the fight against the violences we have been witnessing, generally from the uh, security sector uh, against uh, women. I have the tendency to say, I hope I'm right, that uh, if the society can see that you are taking good care of your women in the military, the society will have more respect <coughs> and more confidence in you and will be more willing to work with you on issues like violences against women and against girls. Uh, just very quickly, I, I, again, going back to how, how better to mainstream uh, uh, women in the military. Again, if, if, if we are to believe that the security concerns of the developing world are those of inextricably linked with development and that the militaries can be used as that, that vehicle for the social change and social development, you don't look at the women's issues as this is a feel-good exercise or this is just sort of what it should be. What you start realizing, as Colonel Diop had pointed out, is you are losing 50, oh, sometimes over 50% of your economic capacity because you have excluded that portion of society. 
Whereas if they were included in, in the training, in the vocational training, in the educational programs, and then released into the civilian workforce, which is direly needed in many parts of Africa, what you're looking at is the ability to increase your economic base through leveraging one of the things that Africa has a lot of, which is human resources. So again, it's not a feel-good exercise from a human security standpoint. It's very much about understanding that the security and development are inextricably linked, and how do we best get to a solution that matters for that specific area? And I think that's that's probably a better way to, to go about it. Thanks. The uh, I, I'd ask you a priority of what? A priority of effort? Do you make gender mainstreaming a priority of effort, priority of funding, priority of personnel? If, if, you, ask a, if you ask a commander on the ground to, to make some, something a priority, then so, something's not going to be a priority. Something's going to lose. And I will tell you that in most military operations, gender mainstreaming would not appear on the top five for the priorities. So b because it's, 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 a very, it's very focused, it's very narrow, C civil military uh, interaction is is something broader, and that's something that 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 can that can, that can get some horsepower behind it. So, uh, I would ask you to when you when, you, when you're inter inter interfacing with the military, don't uh, don't ask for for one specific thing. Ask for a, a broader range, and you're more likely to get some support behind it, and it's it's more easily trainable. And that speaks specifically to my initial point that if you make gender mainstreaming an issue, then you're you're sort of rebuilding the road. I, I'm telling you, rebuilding the road is the wrong way to do it because then you have to rebuild every single road that you go down to. You need to build a better car, build a better person, make your people more adaptable, make them more trainable. Uh, one of the things I did not address in my opening comments was our, our cultural support team program. Operationally, we recognized that that um, we had a fault in our, mil in our military, particularly in Afghanistan. In the Afghani culture, you cannot uh, males outside of a particular family group are not, it, it's, it's taboo to speak to a female within a, fa within a, a separate family group. It's, just, it's not done. It creates, it creates huge rifts. It creates issues. Well, special forces teams are traditionally all male teams. So when they go on an objective to, to find a guy or to gather intelligence, an entire sector of that population is excluded. We can't talk to the females. So we developed a program where we took uh, female uh, special operators and gave them particular training in, in um, cultural aspects of, of female Afghani culture. And we had a task organized them to down to the operational or the uh, tactical level and put them on targets with, uh, with folks. And those, that, that first set of, of, uh, of ladies is just deployed. Uh, we'll be getting reports from them from the field soon. I'd certainly welcome uh, anyone coming down and looking at our program, seeing how we're training that. But I will tell you is that in developing that program and deciding how do you teach someone to to be a uh, a female Afghani culture expert, the one thing that we started out with was teaching them about themselves, and that's the same step that you take in any single social issue, is learning about yourself first. So that's the first step you take, and that's building the better car. Thank you, Wally. And finally, Stephanie. There are quite a few studies that are analyzing this issue as far as what should the role of the military, women in the military. So I'm not privy to any of those, so I don't want to comment specifically on that. The only thing I do want to say, though, is um, if things happen quickly in the military, often it's not good. Um, so having deliberate thought through processes is not bad at all. Um, I think one of the challenges that I've seen, though, is that the 21st century challenges, whether we're talking about the, the human security, whether we're realizing there's no longer a front line that there used to be, um, women are engaged in many activities. Um, as a company commander, I was valued because I could do my job, not because I was a woman. My brigade commander was a logistician. She helped push in the, the logistics, the supplies, um, at the, the very early stages of, of conflict, and she was valued because she could deliver the mission. Um, I think this time is ripe to focus on this issue. I'm glad that from a scholarly <coughs> perspective, at the practitioner's perspective, that this, um, this dialogue is happening. And, and again, I, I appreciate all of you working on this issue because I think we can help make a difference, um, but we need to definitely move forward smartly. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I think uh, we've heard from uh, an excellent uh, and, and multiple and diverse perspectives on uh, the role of gender mainstreaming in the military. 
Uh, we are going to take a very brief break only to exchange panelists because now we're going to hear from the civil society side of this conversation and try to bring uh, these views together. But before anyone steps up, I hope you will join me in a really warm round of applause for this fabulous panel. We'll reconvene in four minutes. <laughs>